Yep. So this morning um, we sort of focused largely on that that sensory discriminative domain of pain, which should already give you a fair bit of information. If you've got a patient that comes in, they say their pain is a 7 out of 10. Right off the bat, you're recognizing that it seems a bit high. Of course, you're interpreting that within the context of how you ask the question. You may have had them complete a body diagram. Maybe you're showing some just sort of localized pain. Maybe they're showing something a little bit more widespread. Maybe they're showing something completely global and diffuse. Each of these things are telling you something a bit different about what might be happening. Maybe you've had them complete an S-Lens or a pain detect or a DN4 or some other uh, qualitative indicator of their pain. And every one of these responses are helping you sort of zero in one direction or another as far as where you think that primary pain mechanism may be, where that biggest window is for you to sort of get inside and try to help these folks. Maybe some qualitative or quantitative sensory testing as well has helped you say this appears to be more of a local hyperalgesia, this is something a bit more widespread. And all of these things now you're starting to sort of triangulate, you're starting to keep those in mind and figure out where your best way, uh, your best entry is into the uh, patient's pain condition. Now we're going to go on to, we're going to move from the sensory discriminative piece and we're going to move into this cognitive and evaluative and sort of, as I say, beyond the foramen magnum piece. Which certainly I know in in physio, we have a habit of sort of, you know, sticking from sort of C not one down. Um, but we don't want to forget, of course, about what's happening in this big giant supercomputer. We'll talk about the art and science of quantifying thought, beliefs, and perceptions about pain. I'm going to start here. So again, we'll do one of these pull everywhere things. Dave, are you able to uh, push this? It's already up. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well done. Um, so. The question here, and of course, I think we're only going to get the first 40 responses, but of the following scales, you can answer more than once. Are there any here that you've used clinically? If you haven't, then just don't reply. And I'm curious to see if there's any of these that people are either familiar with, or have either used themselves, or seen used clinically. That's pretty well what I would have expected. Maybe a bit more on the FabQ. Oh, huh. as I say that. <laughs> Okay. Great. So that helped me out a little bit then. So not uh, not a ton of experience with these scales, but uh, a few people do have some experience with uh, TCS in particular and the fat Q. Great. We're going to talk primarily about the top three. Fortunately, those happen to be the ones that are most common as well amongst our group. So that's perfect. What I want us to do here for this module over the next 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to understand the value of some of these cognitive and attitude questionnaires. Distinguish between cognitive and emotional or affective tools. We're going to understand uh, to how we judiciously apply and interpret the pain catastrophizing scale, the fear avoidance police questionnaire, and the Tampa scale for kinesiophobia. And then we're going to hopefully at the end have a bit of time to discuss issues around screening for psychopathology by non-psychologists or psychiatrists. So I, uh, I mentioned this earlier this morning, this difference between cognitions and emotions. And again, I think it's an important distinction, but I'm going to bring it up again one more time here. It's important not just because there's sort of conceptual differences here. Emotions, we may actually be screening perhaps for a, for a pathology. Whereas with cognitions, there's really, it's hard to say that there's a right or wrong, right? This is just the way people think, okay? Um, there may be, I suppose, adaptive or maladaptive. There are uh, a couple of key uh, differences we need to keep in mind. First of all, cognition or cognitive scales are usually interpreted along a continuum, rather than looking for sort of a set cut point of this is good versus this is bad. That said, there are a couple, a couple of scales we'll talk about today do have cut points recorded in the literature that give you a bit of guidance as far as whether they're sort of too high or too low. But normally it's along a continuum. We're not there talking about diagnosable psychopathology. Um, and I, I suppose it's important to recognize that just because someone scores high on some of these scales doesn't necessarily mean it's problematic. Okay? They may in fact be quite rational. Uh, we just need to interpret them properly. I'll talk about how to do that. 
When we're talking about emotions or affect, um, we're looking at how the pain makes the person feel rather than how they think about it. Usually, measurement there is more of a dichotomy, either a, especially if you're using this as a screening tool. So a pathologist is either present or absent, right? They either reach the threshold for depression, like a major depressive disorder, or they don't. Um, and like I say, usually we're, we're, we're measuring negative affect. A lot of them can be used to screen for diagnosable psychopathology as per the sort of Bible of, of psychopathology, the, the uh, Diagnosis and Statistics Manual for, or the more recent five, which just came out for psychology. And there are different properties uh, that are desirable between these things. So uh, talking about our cognitions, um, here's a couple of examples. Okay, this certainly is by no means exhaustive, but uh, we can talk about catastrophizing, pain-related fear, kinesiophobia, which as everyone knows is the fear of kinesiologists. Uh, it says the victimization, that joke never gets old. Hilarious every time. So we're going to talk about um, at least the top three tools that can be used for each. Uh, what is, I'm sorry, kinesiophobia. What is kinesiophobia? What's that? Fear of movement. Fear of movement. Yeah, fear of movement or re-injury. That's, that's the way it was originally uh, described. Again, why are we measuring these things? So for each of these tools so far today, we've talked about their value for prognostic purposes, evaluative purposes, discriminatory or diagnosis, um, uh, and discharge planning and treatment decisions. Here I think that we've got uh, a number of reasons for measuring some of these things. So prognosis in particular, as I mentioned, high pain catastrophizing is a, is a consistent predictor of core outcome, uh, both in neck and low back pain. So that is something we want to capture. Um, high levels of catastrophizing may also give you some treatment decisions here. It may help you say, oh, that's one of the big windows I need to jump through, first of all. And I think we are in a pretty good position as clinicians here, non-psychologists even, to address catastrophizing. Um, treatment decisions, as I say, uh, evaluating effectiveness. I will say most of the tools we're going to talk about here don't have a lot of information about their responsiveness, whether they actually evaluate change over time. Probably less value uh, there. Like I said, there's no value there. There's probably less value at this point. Um, you may, however, use them as to prepare for discharge. You may decide that before somebody goes, you want them to score maybe under a certain threshold, say on the work subscale of the fear of beliefs questionnaire, because that predicts a more successful return to work. So there may be some discharge planning use here. Um, then there's this whole part about emotional pathology. And we're going to talk a little bit maybe about whether we should even be doing this. Um, but just to sort of, I guess, offer a little bit on the yes, we should side. Why would we do this? Um, you know, psychopathology is potentially an important comorbidity, especially in chronic pain. We recognize, for example, that depression is overrepresented in populations with chronic pain. 50 to 70 percent, in fact, of, of the chronic pain population probably meet the threshold for diagnosable depression. And certainly, this seems to influence our, or it would probably influence our treatment outcomes. Uh, prognosis: There's some existing, there's some evidence that pre-existing uh, pathology may. Uh, lead to a poorer prognosis. So I would say that evidence is not as strong as perhaps we think it should. It is, but um, there is certainly some evidence out there. Uh, some of the, just as a direct example, uh, Sterling uh, earlier on, back in 2005, showed us that early exaggerated post-traumatic stress symptoms might be a predictor of uh, long-term problems. And this is something that perhaps we don't always appreciate, but it may affect your treatment decisions. I was at a session at the World, World Confederation of Physical Therapy uh, Congress a few years back when I was in Vancouver. And this session was on interpersonal violence uh, and how it affects physical therapy. I was struck by this, actually, the statistic that when you consider interpersonal violence being physical, sexual, emotional abuse, one in three females and one in eight males uh, will have experienced this at some point in their lives. Now, the interesting part about that, several interesting things, but one of the things that is of relevance, especially to those of us who tend to do a lot of hands-on work, is that these may be folks for whom putting your hands on and assuming it's okay to go and stick your hands on and start mobilizing and moving them around um, 
possibly premature, and inappropriate, and that uh, you should really make sure that regardless of who you're going to put your hands on, you always get permission to do so, first of all. Now, whether or not this is actually psychopathology or really possibly, um, but nonetheless, recognizing that um, previous call it psychological experiences certainly can influence your, your treatment decisions and how you proceed, I think, is going to be very important. So we'll keep some of those things in mind.